So coming to Rod, you know, we are doing, you're doing the pretty much the opposite thing, which is you came in with a brand, the brand left, you said, I'm going to start my own thing, and you set up your own brand called Rod Anchor. So just give us the flip side of that. How do you, you know, what are, for, just Rod, quickly, because you work for a global brand, what are some of the global benchmarks? Just two, three, five global benchmarks that salons need to hit uh, that, that you see, that you saw from the international brands. And then separately, secondly, why did you decide to build your own brand and not bring in another international brand? Well, that's a, that's a pretty straightforward answer as far as why didn't I bring in another brand? I'd be already invested, um, you know, five or six years in the country. And after, you know, 20 odd years in, in foreign countries or native countries to me, it didn't make sense for me to now bring in a third party that didn't understand the Indian market as much as I already did. So for me, it was a natural thing to do. That's not meaning that it's not right for others. Um, but also being um, hands-on in the salon, it makes more sense for me to utilize my own name versus bringing a third party into it. Some of the challenges that we have, that we all probably have, everyone out there, everyone up here, is standardization or being able to deliver a global product or a global service or each and every time, it's almost impossible um, to be able to monitor it on a multi-level or a multi-salon situation. It's okay to say we have steps in place, but can you actually guarantee it? It's become very difficult in a market where the talent, as we talked about before, there's such a shortage of talent. So I think one of the biggest problems we have is manpower and I know we'll talk about that later, but um, manpower and the retention of manpower um, is a huge issue. As far as global standards, um, the biggest difference or point of difference for me coming from Australia or Singapore or Hong Kong to India where the market is just developing is the, the culture within the salon. Sorry, can you say that again? It's the, the culture within the salon. So the biggest challenge for me was being able to fit in that culture that exists in India. The biggest problem that we have um, is that a lot of times someone will invest money and the staff have invested their, their life or their career and there's a huge disconnect between what the staff want out of the, the relationship and what the investor wants out of the relationship. And then it becomes a very um, tug of war where there's little respect or everyone gets sort of... One example of that, Rod, what would that be? Like a, like a disconnect between the investor and the staff? No, and we were spe I was speaking to someone outside earlier and we spoke about someone would... Staff generally, this is a generalization, but it's pretty accurate. Most salons experience this to some extent. Staff won't say much because it's an uneducated sector. Would we all agree? Yeah. So rather than confronting their employer, they much prefer just to have a conversation next door and he'll offer another thousand rupees and the staff will leave. So by the time you've actually cultured and mentored your team, they've just disappeared yep. to somebody yep. else because you've said something wrong or upset them or disrespected them. It hasn't become that profession yet where people have a little more... Um, self-worth or a, a clear direction of where they want to go professionally. So that's one of the biggest challenges that we all have, both as um, employers as well as um, staff. We all have that problem because that is going to set us apart from being a local brand or being able to export that brand internationally. So I think, I mean, there's, multi there's multiple challenges, but um, so that would be one of them. The other one would be I think we all get into a situation where we like to copy and paste. We see someone that's opened up a salon down the road. Sorry, but we'll say, and this is a, this is a reality. Someone will say, oh, he's opening a barbershop. They don't see the fine details. They say, oh, barbershop, we'll do that too. So they do the same thing and they copy paste, yet the culture's not the same, the brand's not the same. 
the the backend's not the same, the vision's not the same. But the price will be so then there'll be a price for for nothing. Well, right? They charge a thousand, I'll charge nine hundred, and I'll get all their clients. It doesn't work like that. So the barriers to entry is uh, is is they are not there in that respect. I guess to some extent the barriers are there from the real estate cost and building up that. But it's very easy to copy and copy paste models and. No, but uh, from a global standard point of view. From the West, the last thing I would do, if he was doing that, I'd completely go to the opposite end of the spectrum and do something totally different. Because it's more, to be more creative and to stand out, I wouldn't want to be the same as everybody else. Okay. So I think rather than copy paste, we have to evolve the industry and put our minds to how we all can have a, a slice of the pie rather than try and take the, the same slice of the pie that everybody's trying to eat from. I think that's the biggest point that I can, that I can make okay. as far as global standards. Thanks, Rod. Blessing from your perspective, you're running Tony and Guy, big international brand. You've got the master franchise for the South, right? You've got 72, you said, how many, how many outlets do you have today? Yeah, we have signed 100 plus and uh, 79 saloon yesterday we launched. Sorry, so you have, you've signed up 100 plus, plus and 100. how many are operating today? 79. 70? 9. 79. So a big, big player in that, in that segment, uh, obviously, you know, bringing in a global brand. Uh, you heard two, two people, one is a, one has started up, you know, bringing a global brand in, one was with a global brand, exited, started his own thing. Uh, just from your perspective, how do you maintain and deliver quality, uh, global quality, because I'm sure the, the, the brand owners must be checking and seeing that, you know, you're, you're not damaging the brand, you're keeping the brand ethos and service levels, etc. up. How do you maintain that? And what is the, and how do you build basically employee retention? Because that seems to be a recurring theme in terms of holding on to people and people leaving, you know, for a thousand rupees or whatever. How do you build that? Just some thoughts around that. And just keep the mic. Ready. Yeah. When it comes to the quality, actually, uh, we, uh, Tony and Guy Academy London, is the world's number one uh, when it comes to the training programs. Uh, so we have the brand backup to train the stylist. So uh, we uh, acquire the talents only from the existing market where the stylist uh, is already working with any uh, no international salon or uh, national brand. Uh, we don't hire any uh, uh, freshers. So we identify, we uh, know people are getting attracted towards the brand because globally the trend is everyone want to uh, work with uh, Tony and Guy or they want to get trained by Tony and Guy Academy London. This is the trend. So but you train, your training is here or you're training people outside yeah, or both? Actually, uh, Tony and Guy has approved as assessed us and approved us to train the franchise partners uh, stylist in our centers. Okay. We have a company one stores, 15 stores we have. So we uh, mastered the art. So we demonstrated, we made it successful so that actually the training happens in our salon. Uh, so uh, we trained them here and also we trained two people to uh, London. We send them uh, to London. So the London Ac Academy trains them and sends back. So the uh, but then how do you retain them? So they have. I am a guy. I've come to your Tony and guy. I've got trained. Now suddenly Rod wants to hire me and pay me some extra money. And you know I'm just taking that as an as, a, as an example. But how do you main, main, maintain? Because the last thing you want to do is have these fantastically trained guys going and working for your for your competition. So back to the point. What is, how do you retain them? What would you do to make it so special that they stay with you? See, that's where the brand plays the major role, actually. So when you have the you know, right brand with you, so retaining the staff is, you know, we haven't you know, uh, uh, faced any major problem in uh, retaining the staff because 60% of the uh, you know, like care was taken by the brand. And uh, uh, you pay them bill, you uh, give them the right incentive structure, so without monitoring, actually people are able to run the uh, business and uh, people, everyone have their own stomach, family and uh, they are very serious about the career. So when we hire people from the local, uh, the market, domestic market, uh, they come with some little attitude. I know I think everyone have attitude, but when we send them to the training, when they come and train with us and when they get the international exposure in uh, uh, London Academy, so they feel that, no, actually they're working with a great brand and uh, uh, there's a lot more things to learn. And uh, no, actually uh, the, they, they, the, the attitude level comes down. They know, they, they know what, where they stand and they're ready to move next level. Okay, so some important pointers there. Global brand, a lot of training, sending them to international markets, also showing them a career path, I guess. 
And do you all, have, I mean, just any of you comment on that. Do you have a fixed and variable element in salaries to make it motivational for people to stay? I mean, is it a variable element based on how many em employees they do, uh, they, they, they take care of on a daily basis, how many cuts they do? Also, feedback from customers, do you take that into account in some in determining their, their variable pay? Do you guys have variable pay in your? Uh, I'll just add to what uh, uh, Blessing was saying. I think. Just uh, keep the mic. Right. Yeah, I said uh, it's very important for the whole education and training uh, calendar to be out at least 12 months in advance. We, I have 125 stylists. I not only uh, seek a lot of support from my parent company in France, but I think uh, also from the brand partners who work with you. So we, for us, Vela is a great partner and uh, they, they provide us some fantastic international and domestic training. So in a nutshell, I train 33 days a year. Each of my stylists, no matter what level of uh, uh, expertise he is in, uh, 33 days a year, that means only 11 months he's working on the floor. I'm paying him for 12 months, but that's the value we give to training. So say education. that again, 33, sorry, what? 33 mm. days a year, so three days a month he goes to school, irrespective of whatever pedigree he is. So that's very important. I think Rod here, having worked in uh, overseas markets, would have at least taken four years to become a hairdresser, and here we, we turn around a guy in nine months, you know? So those are things which we will have to continue investing in as an industry and this applies to whether it's a beautician or whether it's a hairdresser or it's anybody. And uh, yes, I think international brands, I run an international company also, we can definitely learn uh, the luxury or the expertise angle from overseas markets. I don't think India is ready to produce the best of talent. We have great talent, but it will need honing, it will need expertise of Europe, or UK for sure. I personally, that's my stick. But one side is training, right? You can train the people all you want, but does the customer, is the customer willing to pay the price for a higher train? I mean, that's the other flip side of well, it, I right? I think so. I, I mean, if you ask me, I think the customer really wants in such high demanding level uh, times where the customer takes a minute to go on social media to, to happily speak about it or sadly speak about it, I think she is ready to pay. Provided you're able to show her the expertise angle, you know. Just can't say that I'm an expert. You have to demonstrate it. Quickly, quickly. Yeah, actually when it comes to the pricing actually, no, we have a differential pricing where actually the, for the junior stylist we have a price and senior stylist top and a creative director, style director, we have different. Oh, uh, so you have tiered pricing depending on what the customer yeah. wants to yeah, pay. Yes. And, yeah. and I think everybody is sort of doing that. Uh, Mrs. Bharti, what about you? You're running an academy you obviously, you know, are supplying a lot of the talent that goes into these, into these, uh, into these salons, plus your own salon. So quickly in terms of building capability, what is it that you are doing to produce hair, world-class hairstylists? Have you partnered with a global brand? Where do you bring this global knowledge from to, to, to do that? Uh, see, I, 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 <clears throat> I don't agree to him, in, in, first of all, uh, that we have to go abroad only and then we can get the good talent. Uh, once we are teaching well and we are trained from abroad or we are trained practically and theoretically if we know everything. Like I, maybe I was a science student, so that's why I, when I started with my academy, I could do it in such a way that whatever we teach, we teach them scientifically and we teach them practically also so well that I don't think... But so where do you get the global to... trends from? Because today we are not... See, I mean, so do you go to Italy, do you go to France for hair, hair events? Where do you learn some of the latest techniques? See, see, we definitely go abroad and learn few more techniques, but everybody cannot go and once we have a work in clinics and institutes here, so we can learn from there and teach the same thing here. So everybody doesn't have to go abroad and only learn. No, and I don't think he's saying only abroad, because he runs a global, he runs a French brand. So, you know, obviously, and you know, a lot of the, lot of the trends come from there. So from that perspective, it makes sense. But I'm not, I don't think anybody's saying that India can't produce big yes, stylists. of course. But we, we are not the cutting edge when it comes to style globally. No, so, no, I don't agree. Uh, I think uh, we have to understand that what is fashion all about. See, you have fashion which is from London, you have fashion which is from Paris, you have fashion which is from New York. We all, and now we we we, we getting there, right? Absolutely. So it's nowhere taking away any credibility from the Indian talent. I have 99% of my talent is Indian talent. But the fact is that you have to have the expertise angle. Who launches spring summer collections? It only comes in from the West. You know, things like sure, this which sure. we have to... Sure. Develop and take it forward for sure. 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 Yeah, definitely, we learn it. We see, we see abroad. We learn it. And I think we also um, 
try to find out something new all the time. So uh, it's not one person. And how many students do you produce in a year? How many, how many students come out of your institutes in a year? In a year, almost th more than 1,000 students. And Maybe how many of them get absorbed, absorbed in your salons versus? We, we have students, you know, different kind of students, like people who are already into the same business. They come for small, small courses. In that way, we have more than 2,000, 3,000 people. Okay. But the pay one proper course, people who start from the scratch and go till the last, they are maybe 1,000 or 1,000, 2,000 in between that. 